So we now have a great privilege to hear from a man who runs the Arts Council, who knows more than anybody the power of the arts, and I think has some interesting ideas on how they can connect with communities across the UK, and hopefully with our foundation. So ladies and gentlemen, we'll give a big conference welcome, would you, to Peter Bazaljet. Dave, thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. Um, in fact, I want to thank you very much, not just for inviting me here this evening, but for turning up. So I'm getting clues that you had quite a lively evening last night. Is this right? Just a quick test. Who was in bed by midnight? Hands up. Okay, hands down again. Who was in bed by one o'clock? Okay, hands down again. Who was in bed by two o'clock? Hands down again. Who was in bed by three o'clock? Hands down again, who's in bed by four o'clock? You, madam, <laughs> you, madam, are the Community Foundation Clubber of the Week. Well done. Take a bow. Because, you know, I mean, what made me think about that was uh, two delegates I overheard as I walked into the hall. They were just behind me, and one said to the other, did you go clubbing last night? And the other one said back, I don't know, I can't remember. <laughs> But um, Bristol is not only uh, a city of flesh pots and clubs. Bristol is a fantastic cultural centre. Those of you who know it well will know that. And so I'm delighted to be at your conference this morning, and I'm delighted your conference is in Bristol, which is a brilliant place for the arts. Today, I want to set out some thinking we're doing at the Arts Council England about how we can encourage greater philanthropic support for arts and culture and how we can work with UK Communities Foundations to achieve this. Now, I've been fundraising for around 20 years. I don't think I've rattled a tin for a donkey sanctuary or the Hare Krishna, but I've collected money for most other things, certainly for arts and cultural organisations, education and for social campaigns. And by the way, I just loved those inspirational short speeches this morning. Congratulations to the four speakers I heard. What a great thing you have going here. I really enjoyed listening to those short presentations, as I know you did. And having been a fundraiser for 20 years... I know how difficult it can be. Um, I know the glazed expressions on my circle of friends as I approach them for the 20th time, saying, will they come to a dinner or a gala evening? Uh, they come to regard me as the ancient mariner, you know, to be avoided at all costs. <laughs> but I've learned three particular things uh, about fundraising, and everybody in this room knows these things. The first is it's quite tough. But the second is, and you prove it every day, it's possible. And the third is that to succeed in an organisation, everyone in that organisation has to be involved. Now, philanthropy may not be the only answer to the funding challenges faced by arts organisations in particular, but it's pretty important, and we have to find ways of improving it. And let me put it in context. Public funding, the taxpayer's contribution from you and me, remains a bedrock of arts finance in England. But for many years, the emphasis has been passing to other sources. So now, if you will, I want to take the example of what we call our national portfolio organisations. These are the main 700 or so organisations that the tax money we receive goes to via the Arts Council. Okay? And there are 700 of them, as I say. And that includes, by the way, organisations in Bristol like the Watershed and Bristol's Old Vic. They have four main sources of income. The first is grant in aid from the taxpayer. Okay? And that comes in as a proportion of their overall revenue, the money the Arts Council gives them, around 29%. Now, that was in 2012. The year before, it was 33%. So what that says, by the way, about 10 years ago, that would have been 50%. So what that tells us is that the proportion of money coming from the taxpayer, from the government supporting the arts, is declining. And that trend is unlikely to be reversed any time soon. Now, second, there's other public funding. At the moment, that comes in at around 11%. That's mostly from local authorities. Now, there is a similar trend. There are sustained reductions going on in local authority funding of the arts. The latest estimates from the Department of Communities and Local Government indicate that in the forthcoming year, we can expect a 7% reduction in local authority funding. And a, another survey from Audience Development UK paints a slightly worse picture that local authorities are projecting a reduction of around 10% in their arts budgets with more cuts down the line. By the way, I'm pleased to say, in parenthesis, that we also fund the arts via the lottery, 
And because of the people who buy lottery tickets, uh, that, that funding is gently going up. But that's not the funding we apply to the national portfolio organizations. So the third source for our NPOs is commercial revenues. Ticket sales, hospitality, sponsorship, and so on. Now, that's already just around half the cake, 50% of the cake. And that shows how entrepreneurial many of our creative leaders in the arts are. And it reminds us that there are several ways for arts organizations to diversify their revenues. Philanthropy won't always be the answer. We're also, by the way, and we've heard mention of it all this, already this morning, we're also piloting new forms of loans and social investment. But philanthropy is nevertheless very, very important. It's the fourth leg, and at the moment it's currently delivering about 11% of the NPO's revenues. Now, our Secretary of State for Culture, Maria Miller, has summarized it quite nicely. The government's committed, she said, to a mixed economy model where targeted public funding will stimulate money from other sources, whether that's philanthropy or commercially generated. So the question is, the question for me as Chair of the Arts Council, for my fellow councillors, two of whom are actually in the hall today, is how are we going to improve fundraising? Well, first today, I'd like to consider a misconception that I believe exists about the relationship between the arts and charitable sector, a misconception we need to overcome. I think it's a question of identity. One of the reasons it can be tough to raise funds for the arts is that in the wider public mind, the arts are not necessarily considered a charitable cause. A recent YouGov poll asked people what types of organizations they thought public funding for the arts was spent on. And that revealed that only 9% thought the money went to charities. Though in fact, nearly every arts council uh, uh, organization is a charity. And all those NPOs I mentioned earlier, they're charities. So we're not, I believe, in the arts connecting effectively with potential donors. We're not getting our message over. Now, everybody in this room knows we're a charitable nation. According to the Charities Aid Foundation, only the U.S. tops us. In 2006, I, I think we were giving nearly three-quarters of 1% of GDP to charity. But the arts gets a pretty tiny share of that at the moment. Again, according to the Charities Aid Foundation, just 1% of that pot of regular giving goes on organizations that promote the arts. I think we can do better than that. But here's another interesting figure taken from the 200, 2012 Coots survey which shows that among those who gave a million pounds or more to charitable causes, the arts did substantially better. In fact, the arts were third in the list of causes behind foundations and higher education, receiving gifts totaling more than 100 million, 109 million, about 9% of the pot. And in a book that's being published in about a week's time, which is called Richer Lives, Why Rich People Give, by Beth Brees and Teresa Lloyd, uh, they show that among their research, uh, they've got a research sample of rich givers, arts and culture were the most popular cause with an average individual gift of £225,000. So what that tells us is that while we can attract the upper end of donors quite effectively to support the arts, we've been less successful with smaller donors. And although they may not be so rich, there are very many more of them. And they give generously to many charitable causes, uh, other charitable causes. So I think this is a major marketing challenge to all of us in the arts. The public isn't aware of how deeply embedded the arts are in their daily lives and how vital the arts are to every aspect of communities across the nation. Uh, Dave, in his introduction just now, sort of said art for art's sake is one element. It is one element, but what we need to develop is a holistic argument for the arts, art for art's sake, for its intrinsic value, cultural value, enlightenment, excitement, but also we need to look at all the other things it does in society. We need to do both those things, I think. Just look at some of the causes the Charity Aid Foundation reveals are most popular with average donors. They cite education. Well, we do that in the arts. To take one example of one many, one I know quite well, having seen and loved their work, the Arts Council supports the remarkable Grey Eye Theatre Company, whose wonderful recent production of Ted Hughes' Iron Man is used as a basis for primary school workshops in communicating and problem solving, as well as challenging preconceptions about disability. And I saw that wonderful production on the docks in Ipswich, and uh, some of you are nodding, so you're familiar with it. Absolutely wonderful stuff. Now, another um, thing that's cited uh, as, a, as, a, as a source for charitable donations is the homeless. Well, the arts is involved there too. Take Streetwise Opera, who each year helps some 500 homeless people regain their self-respect, running a weekly music program in homeless centres across England and Wales. And what about older people? Well, we do that. 
This April, we launched a million-pound arts and older people in care program founded jointly by the Bering Foundation that will bring quality arts to older people in residential homes. What about public well-being? Yes, we do that too. Take our pioneering books on prescription scheme in which Arts Council England invested working with the reading agency and the Society of Chief Librarians. This made available self-help books for people suffering from mental health problems. It is, in the words of one health worker, a fantastic service. That's just one example of many. Uh, as Alan Yates, chief executive of Mersey Care NHS Trust, puts it, if the arts had not been invented, we would now do so as a frontline NHS service. So the truth is that the arts work everywhere in our communities, helping the retired, the marginalized, the lonely, and the sick. We arrange dance classes. We organize choirs. We hand out books. The arts are a critical factor in social engagement. Just look at the numbers who participate voluntarily in arts and cultural organizations, some 9.4 million people. Now, there's a message we need to figure out how to get over much more effectively. And that's something I hope the UK Community Foundations will help us with via the great work you do in the arts. I'm just going to cite a couple of examples. In Herefordshire, the Community Foundation is supporting a wide range of arts projects, including the annual Herefordshire Young Musician of the Year Award. In Northamptonshire, the Community Foundation manages a bursary scheme for the Youth Theatre at the Royal and Derngate. In Milton Keynes, which we've heard about today, the Foundation has helped fund um, an arts training programme, which I suspect you're probably familiar with. And in Norfolk, the Community Foundation has a record of supporting charities who reach the disadvantaged and disabled through the arts. Graham, you'll, you'll know about that. We heard from you earlier. The best estimate is, is that some 30% of Community Foundation's projects actually use the arts as a tool in their work. It's not how your statistics are presented, but you yourselves have told me that's actually the truth of it. And it's a pretty interesting to, to look at it that way. But I'm not sure that's widely appreciated outside this hall. So I think we need to get that better known. Now, in his report, Philanthropy Beyond London, commissioned by the DCMS last year, one of Peter Phillips' key recommendations, and I'm pleased Peter Phillips is here with us today, was that the arts organisations should stress that their charitable status, they should stress their charitable status with conviction. And he's right. We've got to get across the holistic nature of our work, and we've got to get across the message that it's charitable. Technically charitable, philosophically charitable. Now, as all of us here today know, when you're fundraising, you look to three sources for money, trusts and foundations, businesses and individuals. A brief word about trusts and foundations. There's evidence for the arts of good progress here, fueled by our Catalyst matching scheme, which I'll say more, a bit more about later. Catalyst has enabled more than 400 arts organisations to go out and pitch to trusts in a more focused and powerful way. It's early days, but there's no doubt this matching principle appeals very much to trusts. What about business? Well, six years ago, after the credit crunch, corporate giving fell off a cliff. I don't know if that's your, would be your, uh, yes, I'm getting nods from around the hall. We've all had that experience. Now, companies are doing considerably better these days than they were then. They've got rid of their debts. They've repaired their balance sheets. I got hold of a number last week. Uh, the latest figures showed that since 2008, FTSE 100 companies, excluding the banks, these days we always exclude the banks, um, excluding the banks, have added more than 40 billion to their cash pile. So your average FTSE firm has 1.9 million in the bank. It's good to see them healthy again, but it's a shame that many of them have not restored the support they gave to the arts before the recession. So my message to them is, come and join us again. It's in your interest to have a lively, attractive local culture. This summer I was at Kenneth Branagh's Blood and Guts Macbeth, performed as part of the Manchester International Festival in a church, started with a rainstorm onto mud on the floor, and what, can only, what followed can only be described, I think, as Freudian trench warfare, but it was one approach to Shakespeare. Um, uh, actually, it was pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Uh, but, you know, that was part of the Manchester International Festival. Now, that International Festival was made possible um, with £2 million from five local businesses, it brought 30,000 visitors from the UK and abroad to Manchester and was worth 5.1 million to the local economy. So, to take the holistic point, Dave, you know, it was a wonderful cultural event, but it was an economically significant event, and it was a, 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 an event that helped Manchester assert its sense of identity, its sense of place. More recently, 
Exeter's unexpected festival was sponsored by two retail centres, a chain company, a bus company, a hotel chain and a housing association. Up in Howell, the Freedom Festival is being supported by a communications company as part of their long-standing investment in local culture and businesses, as well as by the port owners, developers and an aquarium. Don't forget the aquarium. Um, and take the example of Bruntwood, and I don't know if you know Bruntwood, a property company up in the northwest, who provide office facilities throughout the north and have established the £80,000 Bruntwood Prize for playwriting, as well as supporting the Royal Exchange Theatre and the West Yorkshire Playhouse. What do they say about their reasons for giving? They say cities need more than just successful businesses. They need culture and life to thrive. If you want the best employees to want to live in your area, if you want great graduates from your local universities, it's all about the local quality of life. And these far-sighted companies across England do underline that, although it may be more difficult to fundraise outside the charmed circle of major arts organisations in London, it is genuinely possible, and those are some really, I think, inspiring examples from outside London. Now, the sculptor Anthony Gormley, he of Angel of the North, um, was talking just this week when he got a, a, an arts award in, in Japan about the different attitude to giving in Japan. He says, there's an absolute belief in the duty of corporate money to reinvest in a collective future. And Anthony Gormley said that just three days ago. So businesses could do more. And maybe they'd want to and would, but we just haven't asked them. I was much taken by a report I read the other day from the United States where corporate giving is more established. But they asked businesses that didn't give the art to the arts, why they didn't give. And the answer from 66% of them was they'd not been approached. So we in the arts have to learn how to ask, matching our appeal to companies' stated priorities, something else the UK Communities Foundation can teach us, something you all have very good experience in, in focusing that pitch. Then, of course, the third critical constituency of donors, and I referred to them earlier, is individuals. It's individuals who've, in many cases, been magnificent, and I, I expect I'd get a nod here, too, in increasing their support very often in, the, in this very tricky five years we've had. And once again, there are people here who are showing us the way. Last year, the Community Foundation in Tyne and Weir gave nearly a quarter of the money it granted to projects involving arts and culture. They've pioneered the Vital Signs Report as a means to identify community needs and have successfully used the theory of change method to help donors see where they can contribute to the community by giving to the arts. I call that clever, analytical, tactical, and perfectly communicated. Yes, let's have some applause for that. Very good. Very good. Don't worry, we'll have community singing later. <laughs> you might be looking at me at this point and saying, uh, yes, but if you get all your, your army of arts supporters on the march, raising as much money as they can, and here are we, the community foundations, raising as much money as we can, are we in opposition? Are we fighting over the same pots of money? You might say that. Maybe we'll discuss it in the Q&A afterwards. Can I just say I'd say exactly the opposite? And I've given you the examples. We are allies. We are partners. And by working together, the arts community and the community foundations, as we've proved with the projects I've mentioned, we can make the cake much bigger than it was before. So I don't see us as fighting over limited resources. I see us as expanding the cake. Now, one of the key incentives to encourage private donations are tax breaks, of course, which exist to sweeten the pill. I believe we have much work to do to extract maximum advantage from tax breaks. Sometimes they're not properly understood, partly because the Treasury... Treasury kindly allows us tax breaks, but I don't think it's in their nature to publicise them. They'd much rather they stayed rather secret. But we can publicise them. I remember speaking to 100 potential uh, legacy givers, donors, at the English National Opera, where I was chairman until about nine months ago. We had about 100 of them in the room. And they were all willing to write legacies to English National Opera, and I asked how many of them had heard about the rule that if you leave 10% of your estate to charity, you reduce your inheritance tax. Two people out of the hundred had heard of it. And that brought home to me how much work we have to do to market tax breaks, even to people who want to give. And our research at the Arts Council tells us that even when donors and recipients know about the breaks, such as share gifts, for instance, they find them complicated and involved. So we have to help with that, and we have to get legal and accountancy professions to assist us more than they do. Back in 2011, the Philanthropy Review estimated that an additional 2 billion of charitable income could be achieved if we could encourage giving 
by making it the social norm. And if we could make it easier for people to give, especially through the tax system. So let me give a warm welcome at this point to the new cultural gift scheme, which began this March. It's opened a door for donors to give objects during their lifetimes and claim substantial tax relief based on their value. Our first contribution came from Hunter Davis, who donated some of John Lennon's handwritten lyrics to Beatles songs. There we are. That's Hunter Davis on the right, Ed Vasey in the middle, and lovely Roly Keating, who runs the British Library, on the left. Now, you've been very good. You've listened to me very patiently, so I think you deserve a bonus. One of the songs was In My Life. Let's hear a bit. Why not? Isn't that lovely? Okay, it's enough. We don't want to spoil ourselves. Actually, in my life, I was on one of those Radio 3 programs where you choose your favourite tracks. Classical, and I chose In My Life, as it happens, because I love that harpsichord solo, though I suspect it was written by George Martin rather than the Beatles. Um, so, now, it's early days with the cultural gift scheme, but um, if it takes off in the future, I hope we might be able to encourage governments, future governments to look at further incentives for lifetime giving. There are further incentives for lifetime giving in other countries. And that's been recommended by the Philanthropy Commission and indeed by that book I mentioned earlier by Theresa Lloyd and Beth Breeze. Before I leave the subject of individual giving, a couple of other important points. There's one group in society to whom even the last five years have been kind, the so-called baby boomers. I know because I'm one of them, as I've demonstrated with my familiarity with Beatles songs. We've had... We baby boomers, we've had 40 years of house price inflation, we've had final salary pension schemes, we've had uncapped pension contributions, something the current generation doesn't get. And now in our 60s and 70s, we've got time in our hands, a good number of us are supporting our local arts organisations, but there are so many more who'd love to if, if they were given the chance. Let's recruit this hidden army. I know myself that when you get involved, the rewards are far greater than the money or time you put in. I think you demonstrated that with some of your stories this morning. Some of the people you talked about uh, uh, are contributing to your own causes. And the other thing that we need to harness, quite moving on from, from the themes I've been talking about, is the new digital world to make our fundraising far more effective. Data collection and sharing to reveal potential new supporters among existing arts attenders. New forms of giving, like the new prototype mobile giving platform Donate. Anybody? Come across Donate. It's just a pilot at the moment. You've, you've heard of it. Uh, it's being piloted at places like the National Portrait Gallery and the VNA, allowing people to give live on their mobiles at the point they're most gratified by the experience they've just had, which is quite an important insight. And then, of course, there are interactive exhibits connecting with smartphones in, in museums, which are becoming widely used. These create user relationships where previously you just didn't know who was visiting if it was a free museum. We're also investing substantially in other initiatives that will encourage information sharing, including 7.5 million on the audience focus grant. As part of this, we're spending more than 3 million with the Arts Council, more than 3 million over three years, to help audience development agencies evolve a national database of arts attenders and to provide our organisations with toolkits for audience analytics. Just on that digital point, we are 10, 15 years into the digital era and we have hundreds of years to go in the digital era. And I, don't believe, begin we've, I, I, I believe we've hardly begun to exploit the possibilities of that in, in relation to charitable uh, fundraising and support for our causes like the arts. So it's a, it's a profound point, and we need, we need to experiment, and we need to push out lots of different things. At the Arts Council, we definitely see it as our job to help our sector raise more money. And we're working on new strategies, and we're already driving some promising projects. I, I mentioned Catalyst earlier. It's now two years old. So far, there have been 408 successful applicants to the three stands of the Catalyst matching scheme. And Arts Council England is helping many of them create endowment-style funds with this matching principle, which is pretty dynamic. And I, I'm sure some of you... Have got, I, I met one of the stories this morning mentioned the matching principle as one of the elements. Here's how um, the catalyst works in, in, in practice. Take the example of the Book Trust, the reading charity. Book Trust wanted to reach disadvantaged children whose limited access to books held them back in life. Preparing to fundraise to match their catalyst grant, they discovered the public didn't understand they needed donations because Book Trust were already known to be in receipt of public money, the public thought they didn't need charitable donations. So they created a separate fund, the Children's Reading Fund. 
That could be distance from their main brand. They also identified cultural changes within their organization to operate charitably. They had to become more commercially minded. As we know in this room, charities have to be good businesses. They had to overcome their reticence and ask for money. What is that British thing about not wanting to ask for money, by the way? It's something probably we all personally in this room have had to overcome. But it's, it's, it's a cultural, cultural challenge for us. And this, the Book Trust had to appeal to celebrity supporters and their existing contacts for donations. Now, the results of the reappraisal were marked. As of March this year, Book Trust had raised or pledged funds in excess, in excess of £400,000, which matching funding from our Catalyst program took to 520000 They cracked the marketing issue about being a charity and raised additional funds to help uh, with the matching. And so it, it, it was really a virtuous circle. They got themselves seen as a charity and they raised additional funds via the matching principle. Through the Catalyst Endowment Fund, matching private money, we're now helping organisations towards a target of £106 million. And I think that's something that's very, very encouraging. Catalyst has stimulated some impressive individual donations. The Turner Contemporary Gallery in Margate, which I don't know if any of you visited, very exciting place that's turning a a very run-down town around. They've secured a single gift of £530,000 from Goldman Sachs Fire Catalyst. The Sage, that great music venue in Gateshead, is launching a second endowment appeal and has been given 500000 by Dame Margaret Barber. And Circus Space has secured a pledge of $1 million from Aileen Getty, the philanthropist. The Bose Museum has already exceeded its targets for the year with some 350,000 in pledges against a target of 300,000 pounds. Just as importantly, as part of Catalyst, we're improving the fundraising skills of our workforce. We're committing 30 million pounds to help 173 organizations strengthen their fundraising capacity because we really do have to have a new cadre of professional fundraisers with greater skills. Of course we need that new generation of skilled fundraisers to help manage this change. We are now launching a separate but connected initiative, the second innovation I wanted to tell you about. We've invested £2 million in a new fellowship in fundraising based at Leeds University and run by the Arts Fundraising and Philanthropy Consortium, uh, bringing together numerous partners from across the arts and charitable sector. I was there on the first day of recruitment. I, I saw 65 bright, ambitious graduates competing for 11 places. This is the beginning, I believe, of a new generation of, training, uh, of trained fundraisers, supporting the arts, joining the existing experts we already have. Now, I said at the beginning it's tough raising money, which I've acknowledged today, but I said it was possible. And I think I've given you some pretty inspiring examples. And I also said everyone in arts organizations involved, we're inclined in arts organizations anyway to appoint the head of development and then think the job's done. But often it's boards and senior executives who land the biggest donations, and we need more, more folk who know how to do this strategically and determinedly. So from October, the Arts Fundraising and Philanthropy Programme, backed by the Arts Council, is running a nine-month series of governance training sessions aimed at chief executives and trustees, and that's going to be led by outstanding individuals from the charitable sector, and I'm delighted that once again we'll be working with the UK Communities Foundation to get regional philanthropists to come along as well. Personally, I think every arts board member should contribute to their organization, whether it's one pound or a million pounds, according to their circumstances. Yes, you said here, here? Yes. It's interesting you should say here. I've been on a few boards where people thought they were there for their opinions. <laughs> and I've listened to their opinions at great length. And I've heard myself saying to myself, bugger your opinions, where's your money? <laughs> of course we need their expertise as well. But um, thank you for your here, here. I'm with you. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think the, 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 the most important principle there is that if you're going to ask people to give, you should have given. Don't you think? Yeah. You, we might hear more about that from you in a minute. Something else, and I, I am near the end now, so have patience. I will get there. Um, to further these ideas, we're planning at the Arts Council an annual event in 2014, the first one. Its working title is Why Give to Culture, where we intend to get legal and accountancy professions together with charity advisors, investment advisors, businesses, CSR leaders, and the CEOs of community foundations too. And I'm very pleased to have Matthew Bocock, who's here today, your former chair. He's joining you. Oh, what a lovely photo of you, Matthew.
the only thing is, Matthew, it's a little bit blurred. Were you out on the town last night? <laughs> no. It's great because Matthew's joined the Arts Council, along with Peter Phillips, whom I quoted earlier, who's also here today. And I'm really pleased that we've got uh, people who've thought deeply about philanthropy on the Arts Council board to help us develop these strategies further. Now, one other thing. People who give generously like to be thanked. And I think they richly deserve to be thanked. I'm promising to write to thank any significant donors to any of our partner arts organisations. It might be £100, it might be £10 million, but it has to have made a real difference to the organisation. Because I do have a day job, I'm restricting it to two donors per organisation per year. And I've just sent out my first letters to supporters of Opera North in Leeds and the Hall for Cornwall Theatre. In, um, the Hall for, yes, it's called the Hall for Cornwall Theatre. It's in Truro. Uh, in conclusion... While all arts organisations need to find additional sources of revenue, and philanthropy may not always be the answer, it's an incredibly important answer. And that 11% figure I gave you earlier, I do believe we can make that higher. We genuinely have the means to increase it if we pursue the right strategies. I strongly believe that we can improve fundraising for arts and culture, chiefly because we already have so many good examples, so many inspiring examples of generosity. We know what's possible, and it's something we have to do. It's that simple. Our world-class culture may be admired internationally, but by us, it's cherished. It's not just part of our national conversation. It's the very essence of who we are. It's a wonderful thing to support. Thank you for listening to me today.